you. So uh, today I'd like to give you an introduction to to cryotomicoscopy, but from a mathematician's uh, point of view. Okay, so so cryotom has recently made a big news due to the very recent uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry. I wrote to three of the pioneers in, in cryotomicoscopy uh, development and studies. Uh, so. If you read here, so for developing cryo EM for the high resolution structure determination of compound molecules in solution. Uh, now, this should not, this no price, perhaps does not come as a surprise for, uh, for people uh, working in the field or anyone who is following a uh, uh, journal such as uh, Nature and Method uh, or Science because you, you see like articles like this, the resolution will not be crystallized. The move over X-ray crystallography cryo is picking up the storm structure of biology, or even the internet machinery of the cell, or, uh, or this uh, science of 2014, the resolution revolution. Uh, so cryo uh, has been around actually for something like four decades, but uh, like, like we discussed uh, earlier today, it, got a nickname of, of globology. And, and, and the reason for this uh, not so nice nickname is that uh, the resolution it could achieve was not atomic scale resolution. Okay? Far from what other methods like exocrystallography or NMR spectroscopy were able to achieve. So like, it, it achieved like 6 or 7 atom resolution with very nice symmetric uh, virus set. But it failed to reach Promise of say, uh, to answer and it was only in recent years, let's say in the last five years, that, that it actually fulfilled the promise by, by actually switching to different detectors. And, and the new detector is what allowed it to make this uh, revolution, and, and, and it's not a surprise that this year. So, again, so just another testimony to the realization that. The what Cryam can do, so it's the nature methods, and every year it selects a method of the year, so it was Cryam was selected as method of the year 2015 for its new found ability to solve protein structures at near atomic resolution. So you can ask yourself, okay, what's what's the advantage of, of using Cryam over a method like expert crystallography or NMR spectroscopy for finding uh, three dimensional structures of, of Molecule of biological interest. And there are two main advantages, as uh, I see them. One is that it completely bypasses the need to crystallize the molecule. So, for expert crystallography, you need, you need a crystal uh, structure, you need to define, say, chemical physical conditions in which you can actually form a crystal. And that's actually sometimes a notoriously hard problem. Okay, so there are some proteins that, that so far we stood all our attempts for. And the other major advantage is that single particle cryo-EM, in single particle cryo you individual, you, you image individual particles, individual molecules. So unlike, say, expert crystallography or NMR, where the signals that you measure, say, diffraction patterns or, or the other kinds of measurements that, that you made are actually, it's, it's, it's a measurement that, that that correspond to aggregate superposition from all the molecules inside the water solution or inside the crystal. And, and in single particle cryo the images that, that you obtain correspond to individual particles. So if those particles have different, uh, slightly different uh, structures, there is some structural variability, maybe they come in different conformations, slightly different shapes, then potentially you should be able to resolve that structural variability. And why now? As I already alluded to this, that this is due to advancement in, in detecting technology. So, if in the old days uh, they would simply, the detector would simply take still images, now they can actually take videos. And there is some motion that people did not predict that would, would, would occur in, in, in the images. But in the old days, you'd get a lot of motion blur. And now they can correct for the motion blur and, and get a much, much higher resolution image. Okay, so I, I need to tell you at least briefly how CryoEM uh, works. Up 
in this introduction. So what you see here are not actual true molecules, it's just up, up this concept. So in the, in the experiment, what they do, they freeze uh, the molecule in a very thin layer of ice. So the ice layer is so thin that if you look at it in the vertical direction, the predictive direction, you'd see at most one molecule. There's just no room for two molecules to occupy the, the, the vertical space. And they basically flash freeze the, the molecules, say so using a liquid atom or liquid uh, nitrogen. And at the moment of freezing, every molecule just picks some random position and random orientation within this ice layer. So, so you can visualize this as if you have, say, a planar soup of, of molecules embedded in, in, in the ice layer. And then you shoot the electron beam using the electron microscope uh, perpendicular to the ice layer. The electron beam goes through the ice layer, goes through the molecules, to the molecules. There is a molecule there. And beneath you have a film or a detector or a, or a video camera nowadays that can that, of, that what it measures are two-dimensional tomographic projection images of the 3D molecule. So the molecules are made of, of protons and electrons, and, and they create some Coulombic electrostatic potential. And the electron beam sees that electrostatic potential. And what you obtain here, every pixel in this big image called the micrograph, every pixel here, the intensity corresponds to the integral of the electric potential in the direction of the beaming electrons. Okay, so if we think of, of the electric potential as a function of, of, of the special variables, x, y, and z, you integrate the z variable and, and, and what you get is an, an image that depends on the x and y. But it's, it's a, a tomographic projection, it's an integral, it's not like an image that you take using your iPhone, let's say. It's a completely different uh, of so, so you, you obtain a big image like this for the micrograph, from which they need to first select the particles. Okay, so, so this is an image annotation problem where they need to find where are the particles and crop little boxes where they believe particles reside. So here, it's only simulation, so you can actually see very clearly the particles. It doesn't look like a big problem. And then from several such micrographs and particles that you pick, you would like to predict the 3D structure of, of the molecule. So that's a very basic example, and assuming there is no heterogeneity, mixture of molecules or different conformation, just one uh, molecule that you'd like to predict its structure. So again, we obtain one image per, per particle. We may have thousands of such uh, particles and corresponding images. So data sets can have 10,000, 100,000, even million particles. The issue is that we do not know the orientation of, 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 of the particles, that, of each particle that generates each of the individual images. So the situation here, at least in terms of the imaging uh, formation model, is very similar to medical imaging. To computerized tomography, where you get, let's say, you want you want to get a de the, say the density map of a patient's brain, and so the patient would, would, would be instructed do not do not move during the during the, the imaging process. Okay, so that when the machine scans the brain from different direction, the machine completely knows register the the, the beam direction in which you look at the brain. But with the molecule, we cannot give uh, similar instructions. Okay. And they just pick random orientations, and you have no idea what are the, the, the orientations <coughs> corresponding to the images. Uh, one thing that you, you could do, you know, to imitate the sedimentary imaging uh, uh, process is simply to tilt the, the specimen, tilt the ice and take another set of images, and tilt again, and again, again, and so on. And so at least you know the relative orientation. So this is done in practice, it's called uh, cryo electron tomography. The problem is it gives you a much lower resolution. Because the electron beam is very highly intense. And so and it, as it goes through the molecule, it basically ionizes the molecule and, and creates a chemical bond that, that makes the molecule. So if you want to get to very high resolution reconstruction, you cannot apply too much uh, radiation because there is radiation damage. 
And so in practice, uh, the most widespread technique is called single particle uh, cryo EM. In single particle cryo EM, you just use a single field, like no field then. Okay, and, and, and then you just have one image per particle. And that's the, that's the, these are the rules of the game that we need to, to address today. So the cryo EM problem, from a mathematical perspective, is, is an inverse problem. And in order to discuss method to solve the problem, first I need to, to discuss what is the image formation model, what is the forward model. So I already mentioned it, but I just like to put it in, in, in some equations. So we have a molecule that we want to reconstruct, and the molecule is described by some electrostatic potential function phi. So phi is just a function of x, y, and z, and it can real values. values. And the measurements are uh, projection images, n of them. And a projection image is, is a function of the like, xy variables. So these are just a local coordinate system in the in the in the image plane. And the intensity in the xy pixel is nothing but taking the integral of phi. But first you need to rotate phi by right? its unknown rotation. So rotation you can think of it as, as, a, just as, as a three by three. A matrix, that is a rotation matrix, an element of, of the rotation group SO3. And there is a slightly other complication that I don't want to discuss too much today, and that the images are also convolved with, with this uh, contrast transfer function, TI. In practice, we know that the, the TIs, but they, they introduce some, some complication that I don't want to go into today, okay? So I think of it as like a second order complication in, in the mathematical formulation. But we know how to deal with it. But very importantly, there is also a very large noise level. Okay, so what you see here is a clean projection image, but on top of the tomographic projection, we also contaminate the images with lots of noise. So we have n such images, let's say in size L by L pixels. And the cryo-m basic image problem is to try to estimate the structure phi given the n images. Yeah, question. Are you going to do the particles are the same? Yeah, so the basic assumption in Crowe-M is to see that all the particles are having exactly the same structure. They just have different orientations, different positions. But there is also the heterogeneity problem, just the next bullet, where you want to estimate n different structures. Okay, every particle can have a different structure. And you want to estimate from the n images. Now, clearly, this is a, a very ill posed problem because you have just and two-dimensional images for which you want to estimate and three-dimensional objects. So this is both unless you make some restrictive assumptions about the, the structure. For example, let's say they all come from just two possible classes. Or, or they all, if you are, let's say, to more some flexible motion, then let's say there are only a, a small finite number of degrees of such flexible motion, and then the structure goes on to some low dimensional manifold. So the first thing that we would like to understand when we try to solve this, this maybe complicated inverse problem is how do we solve it when the images are clean, when there is no noise, okay? Still we don't know the, the orientation associated with the images, so, so how, do we, how do we do that? So how do we predict this 3D structure by just looking at, say, a dozen of projection images that look like this? So if you've seen enough Disney movies in your lifetime, then can make some clever guesses, but perhaps, <laughs> but it's still, but, but it, it, it will not be very, very to very high resolution. So there is a very key fundamental mathematical theorem in, in, in the theory of Fourier tomography called the Fourier projection size theorem that allows us to solve the, the cryo-m problem at least for clean image. And what the size theorem says, it's, it relates somehow the 3D Fourier transform of the 3D object with the 2D Fourier transform of the 2D projection images. So if you consider a 3D object and, and now you generate 2D tomographic projections of that 3D object, and then you take the 2D Fourier transform of such <coughs> projection images, then what the slice theorem says, it says that the values of, this, of the 2D uh, Fourier transform, the projection images, 
are nothing but the restriction of the three different transform of the molecule or the object to a central slice, a central plane that goes to the, the origin of the cerebral space and whose orientation exactly corresponds to the orientation of the molecule or is just perpendicular to the viewing direction. So, for example, if you do medical imaging, stress tomography, and the machine will take projection images from different directions, then every projection image, if you will take its 2 d free transform, then you can populate the 3D reciprocal space with, with the free transform of that projection image, and you know where to, where to put the slice, because the machine knows the view direction. And once you've taken enough enough uh, images in different view directions, you can basically populate the entire uh, Fourier, Fourier domain and then do 3D Fourier inversion and get the, the, the molecule or the density map of the brain in real space. Okay, so it's like tomography 101 in one slide. <laughs> and, and now you, you can also say, okay, so how does this, this very fundamental theory can help us uh, solve the problem problem? So there is the notion of geometry that comes to our rescue. Okay, so, so we know that every projection image, if we take its 2D Fourier transform, corresponds to a slice that goes to the origin in, in the Fourier space. So, and we know, okay, I don't know, from, from elementary school or high school, that every two planes in, in, in three space intersect with a line. Okay, unless they are parallel to each other, okay? So two central planes will intersect the line. So this means that if you take two projection images and take the two uh, dimensional Fourier transform, then we know they correspond to two central slices. So they must intersect the line. Let's say the, the red line that you see here. Well, this means that if you say compute the, the 2D Fourier transform on a polar grid, then there should be a radial line in image A, take the red line here, and a radial line in, in in image I, the red line here, on which the values of the 2D Fourier transforms completely agree. And these values would, would be nothing but the values of the 3D Fourier transform restricted to the line in, in, the, in the 3D Fourier space. So one can actually go ahead and, and compute the 2D Fourier transform on a polar grid and put for search for a pair of lines, one line in image I, one in, line in image J on which the Fourier transforms agree. And if the images are clean, and let's say the molecules have no special symmetry, so you just get generic values for its, for its 3D Fourier transform, then once you find the common line, you know where the two planes intersect, and you've almost determined the relative orientation between the two images. There is only one degree of freedom that is left undetermined, which is the angle between the two planes. Right. So SO3, the group of, of, of confrontation in three space, has three parameters, let's say three order angles, and you've determined two of, two of them, except for one angle between, between the two planes. So maybe a question for the audience, how, how are you going to determine that angle between the two planes? Look for a third one. Look for a third one. Okay, so this brings us to the mid-80s. So this was discovered more or less independently in the East and in the West. And yeah, so the algorithm is called angular substitution. So for the three pairs of common lines between, between the images, uniquely determine the, the, the relative orientation. Well, you can still globally rotate the, the, the molecule, of course. But there is also another issue of, of, of handedness or, or chirality that, that would remain undetermined. So, and, and, and with single positive prior, we, you, 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 you can never get the handedness. And I can show you a very simple illustration, but just just take a look at my two my two hands, okay? And I claim that you'll never be able using single particle cryon to differentiate between my right hand and my left hand. And the reason being is that the projection images are going to be to look exactly the same. Okay? So your construction of my right right hand, let's say, corresponds to one set of rotations. There is another set of rotations, okay? That's conjugated to the to the correct, let's say, to the, to the right uh, set that would generate exactly the same projection images. So that's why we put this little uh, ball to the right of the 
of the Mickey Mouse head, because in your construction it can also appear to the left, and you have no way of determining. You just do a single puppy of crying, which one is, is the correct one. You have to do, let's say, a low resolution field series to determine the karate of the model. From, let's say, from the rigidity perspective, the common line information basically gives us the angular distance between, between the, let's say, the three points for the, for the, that correspond to the common lines. So if you look at the image plane, every pair of common lines basically determine the angle between them. So you know, so you know those angular distances, and we know that three angular distances would uniquely determine a triangle. Right, just like three distances would uniquely determine a triangle plane to plane, but only after a global rotation and also reflection. So this this is the is the reflection issue that, that comes up. Okay, so that's angular reconstitution. It's a very neat neat uh, algorithm, and, and now you can ask yourself, okay, does it work well with noisy images? Okay, because my cryon images are not they're not so clean, and so. You run a simulation in which you say make clean projection images and just add wild Gaussian noise to them at different level of SNR. And the typical level of SNR corresponding to experimental images is somewhere around here, okay, to the minus six or to the minus seven. And I'll, I'll show you the next some, some some images. And so here is more more as a detection rate of our ability to detect common lines reliably. Okay, so we say that we detect the common line reliably if, if, if let's say, the, the direction of the, of, of the line that we find is by normal, let's say, 5 or 10 degrees from the true location. And so our ability to detect common lines <coughs> occurs very quickly with the, if the SNR goes down, and maybe only, say, 1 in 10 pairs of, 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 of images will detect the common line correctly. So if you try to do any reconstitution, and you need three pairs of common lines to be detected correctly, only one in a thousand, okay? You'll succeed, you have to be very lucky. And even if you succeeded, then you have, once you have the fourth image and the fifth image, so you're, you're about to make mistakes, and those mistakes will accumulate. And so, and so this raises the question of how we solve the problem for the low SNR, okay? So because the low SNR is the regime that we care about, because this is what what uh, is typical for the experimental <coughs> So one way to try to do it is, is, is to, do, to design maybe better common line approaches that would not just start from three images and then add a fourth image, fifth image, and so on, but maybe somehow take all the common line information from all pairs of images and somehow find a, a, a solution that is consistent possible. This definitely helps, but and I'll discuss it very briefly the technique about it, but, but it still does not solve a very low SNR, okay? I'll, I'll show you here why. <laughs> or you can try to improve the SNR, okay? If the SNR is the problem, let's, let's try to suppress the noise and boost the SNR maybe by averaging images. If we have lots of images, let's say 100,000 images, let's try to find <coughs> images that correspond to, to up in the same viewing direction and then average them after rotational, infinite rotational alignment, and this would, this would boost the SNR. Okay, again, this, this helps, but <coughs> all of this improvement, there is still a fundamental obstacle that I wanted to realize. And the fundamental obstacle is that estimation of rotations is impossible or too erroneous at very low SNR. And the reason why you cannot estimate rotation at, at, at low SNR, like the uh, angular execution is trying to do, is because even an oracle, okay, that would try to estimate the rotations would fail. Okay, so so let's say let's say an oracle knows the structure of the molecule. Okay, only knows five. There is no nothing more that you, that, that you need, right? The oracle knows five. He you knows the structure of the, of the molecule. And then, to estimate rotations, what the oracle would do, he, he or she would simply, or it, would simply generate clean projection images of the, of the known structure, and then try to fit, to match the experimental noisy images with the clean projections. But if the noisy projections are very, very noisy, 
just the noise in the images would somehow align with one of the templates instead of the signal, okay? So again, if, the, if, if you have a noise bar and sigma squared, then the correlation between some noisy reference image and the template would, just the noisy part would compute something like, like square root of sigma squared, right? Like sigma for the correlation. And if sigma is large enough, then just by chance, you'll get some, you'll get some good fit with some random template instead of the true one. So, if an oracle cannot find the, the rotation, then estimate them accurately, then you should not expect any sophisticated algorithm that only looks at the noisy images to be able to estimate rotation. So, okay, so still, it's, it, Zara genes where the SNR is not so bad, okay, where, uh, where, where you would want to estimate rotations and, and improve upon uh, what the execution is doing. So, here is like one example, okay? So, just to give you a sense of, of, of what can be done. So, with, with, with a bit of notation, let's say that you find the common lines for L between any pair of images, I and J, and, and let's say this is a point on the unit circle, X, I, J, Y, J, where image I intersects with image J. You concatenate it with zero, call this vector of C, A, J, it's a vector in the, in the, in the X, Y plane. You know that once you rotate C, A, J by the true rotation R, I, it will take it from the, say, the, the X, Y plane, this takes to its correct location in, in, in R3. Meaning that if you also rotate C, J, I, okay, which is this vector concatenated with zero, with R, J, it's the common line, so, so you should get equality. Okay, this equation of R, I, C, A, J equals R, J, C, J, I. So you can write a over determined system of, of linear equations, right? Because you have an order of n squared equation that you can write for every pair of images, i and j. So you have n choose two equations that you can write, and only an order of n variables, the rotation. And the first thing that one can try is to, is, is to solve an e squares problem. Okay, so you write an energy loss function or cost function, which is just quadratic, uh, a quadratic of this form. The only complication is that you'd like to see the solution which is in SO3. Okay, so if, if you completely relax that constraint, then there is a trivial solution of delta zero. Okay, so no, there are zero. So, so trying to find a solution in exponentially large cell space, which is also not complex, is, is a bit of an issue, okay? But you can go about it with some modern uh, uh, technology, so so doing some convex relaxations, okay? So either spectral relaxation or seven different programming relaxations. And there is a very nice connection between this optimization problem and, and very like, well-known famous problems in, 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 in graph theory called Max Kasper, which was earlier introduced in a, a seven different programming relaxation. These are polynomial time algorithms that work very well in practice up to some level of, of, of final to noise ratio. Okay, so then, there is no magic that they will work at any SNR. Okay, so the frustration comes from the fact that you can add more and more images, but the mean squared error in estimated rotation does not have full. Okay. Okay, so again, you can also try to, to improve the SNR. So I just mentioned this because uh, it, it might uh, resonate with some of you in, in some other application. So, for example, you can view the images as, as nodes of a graph, okay, and and try to find similarities between between pairs of images. If there is similarity between a pair of images, you can put an edge between those two images, and an affinity weight, say wij, that would let's say between zero and one, that would tell you how much how similar the two, the two images are, and and then basically, if you can find the actual true neighbors for, for, for image i, which is neighbors in the sense of, 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 of you actually find a, a similar v direction, then you'd like to rotationally align and, 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 and average, and then you can boost the SNR. And in fact, you can also use the information, the rotational alignment, say the optimal transformation that aligns two images, not just how well they are, that they agree with each other, but you, that is encoded in, in, in just in the way. And the generalization of some nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods of, of, that, are go, that go by the transfer flash and eigenmaps or diffusion maps. 
and we call the regionalization and also use the transformation vector diffusion method. And so here is for, for example of how averaging can really boost the SNR. So it's like a set of experimental images provided by Pfizer. So you're up in France from Colombia, and these are the, the class averages corresponding to those images. And here I'd like to show that indeed this 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 very simple pipeline of boosting the SNR and then using a sophisticated common lines approach can actually work. Okay, it's not just a mathematical curiosity. So what you see here are just four images out of a much larger uh, set, experimental uh, data set of 27,000 particle images. Uh, and this is something we did a while ago. Okay, it's definitely not a high resolution, just to show you that, that you can get a good initial model. So in yellow, you, you see the ground truth, and we know the ground truth because there is a crystal structure, actually. The Nobel Prize in 2009 was the one for getting the, the structure of the ribosome using a crystallography. And in white, you see a reconstruction from the 27,000 experimental particle images by following this two step approach of the first class energy to, to boost the SNR, and then looking at the common lines and using uh, a method such as a special relaxation for, for solving the SDP for solving for them. So, <laughs> how big was that? How big was what? What was the spatial scale? Oh, so <coughs> this molecule is, is uh, it's called the 50S ribosoma, ribosoma subunit. I think it's a few hundred kilodaltons of okay, molecular weight. Okay, so, so probably in uh, Amsterdam, maybe some, I don't know, the diameter of maybe something, 100 or something, of that order. Okay. Okay, but. So now we want to solve like the real problem, okay? Uh, how to solve the cryon form at very low SNR, okay? Because we want to get the smaller and smaller molecules, not like bigger is the ribosome, for which uh, we can't really predict the initial model using this two-step approach. So how do people solve cryon uh, nowadays? So there is a very popular software called Relyon. And I want to tell you what Relyon is doing. So Relyon basically is solving the maximum likelihood uh, formulation. And what is the maximum likelihood? Okay. So the maximum likelihood is basically doing what the Oracle that I mentioned before is doing. So it's, it's trying to find a 3D structure phi that agrees the most with the experimental images, meaning that if you would say, project this, this, this structure as many different directions, it would agree as, 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 as best as possible, let's say, in the least square set with the experimental images. And the way you do it, they start with some initial model, okay, maybe it's with some very low resolution, and, and then in every iteration they do the following. First, you project the, the initial model in many different directions, you get those template images, and now for every experimental image, you match it to the templates and you assign a probability. Okay? So basically you get a distribution or a weight for, for every experimental image. What what is the possible rotation that can be associated with it? And once you have that, you can update your structure. Okay, and, and, and you iteratively in this EM, rotation maximization approach, you you refine the structure. So this is something called Iterative refinement. Uh, there are very well known issues with this. For example, it can be quite slow because you have to sift through the entire data multiple times until convergence. Also, there is it requires an initial model, and it could be that for different initial models you get converged to different molecules. That's not very good if you want to validate your result. And and the reason why it may converge you to different solutions is because we know that EM is not guaranteed to return the, the global, uh, global uh, optimum of the likelihood function. You're only guaranteed to find the, the local uh, optimum. So there's some improvement to, to this uh, uh, technique uh, that, that has to do with stochastic gradient descent and, uh, and trying to, to solve this problem like one frequency at a time, you know, to smooth the, the cost function, but still there are these issues. So, uh, 
And also from the mathematical point of view, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit discouraging that okay, we apply this black box of, of expectation of simulation, but we, we don't have any good, even if it works, we don't have any good understanding about the problem. By that I mean like, okay, so given a signal to noise ratio, like how many images do we really need in order to get the reconstruction? So what I would like to show you next is, is, is a method that that can solve the problem with just one pass over the data, okay, without going through the data multiple times in iterations, and also give us a very good idea of how many images are needed in terms of the SLR. So I didn't invent that method, okay? It, it, it was existed at least for uh, 40 years, okay? And it was proposed by Zvika from the White Institute. And so more than, 50, more than 40 years ago, uh, he proposed this, 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 this idea of the reconstruction of structure from electron microwaves of randomly oriented particles. And just so you believe us, to quickly read at least the first part of that, but a new method at the time, okay, for enhancing the reconstruction the three dimensional structure of randomly oriented particles from their electron microwaves, which was developed. The method requires as an input many pictures of randomly oriented identical particles. The analysis is based on the calculation and accumulation of the special correlation. Okay, so we'll see autocorrelation moments in a second of the density of the densities of the electron microwaves for which the spherical harmonic coefficient of the structure can be found. The process of enhancement of the special correlation and the averaging out of background noise enables reconstruction by using pictures with low signal to noise ratio. Okay. So before jumping into CRIM. Okay, also mathematicians, they like to, when they're faced with very complicated form like Crowley, I mean, in 3D and, and, and SO3 and such, they try to abstract, the, to make an abstraction of, of, of the problem, to try to solve a much simpler problem, maybe one dimension, that at least have the same features of the more, say, complicated problem. And once you get a good understanding of, of, of the simplified problem, then you can, well, you start making conjecture, then also you can build your way the machinery that you develop. So in our case, perhaps the most simple, simple problem uh, that mimics the Crowley problem is what we call the multi-reference alignment of one-dimensional periodic signals. So, so suppose there is a signal in one dimension that you want to estimate, like the step function that we see here, and you observe multiple copies of the signal every time with some different shift. And the shifts are unknown, and the signal is unknown. Okay. So, and by periodic I mean that okay, the shifts are really periodic. So think of, of the signal as living on the unit circle. Okay. And every time I just shift its its angle. So clearly, if there is no noise by just looking at one of the observations, we solve the problem. If there is noise, okay, you can either declare one of the signals as the measurement, but then to be a bit of a noisy estimate. So then it's okay, I can compare it to every to all the others, do pairwise alignment, average, and then boost the SNR. And this works, and for this you just need the number of measurement to scale with the like one over the SNR, for so like sigma squared. But how do you solve the problem when the SNR is bad? Okay, when the when, when the sigma is large. So now you cannot see the signal embedded in this uh, noisy realization, and you cannot do pairwise alignment. Right? I mean, you can, you can try to do it, but it will just give you some, some random uh, relative, uh, say, time uh, shift between measurements. It will not correspond to any meaningful uh, time difference. But the hope is that because all of these noisy signals contain this clean template, the hope is that if we take enough of such measurements, noisy measurements, there should be a way to somehow aggregate the information in all these noisy signals and be able to predict what is the underlying tablet. Again, even an oracle that knows the, the underlying clean template would not be able to tell the shifts, okay? So even if I tell you what is the clean template, you will not be able to tell that that was the shift between those, those two signals by just looking at this noisy signal, okay? You try to do, say, match filtering and call like this with that, you get some, some crazy time delay. Okay, so, so we should 
give up on the idea that we're going to first estimate rotation or the shift and then after the shift do the unshifting all the noisy signals and everything. That's not going to work. So how, how, how are we going to do it? So let me describe to you now a very simple algorithm based on shifting back of, of, of the features that are invariant to the shift. Okay, so, so shift invariant features. So let's, let's say that X is, is our clean one-dimensional signal. Ri is the unknown shift. Okay, the, 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 it's a cyclic shift. Let's say the signal is of length L, so Ri is just cyclic shift of a cyclic group of L elements. And why I have noisy measurements after we contaminate it with, say, Gaussian white noise. So what are, what features can we construct that will be invariant to shift? So one feature is just the average pixel value. Right? If we look at the average pixel value, just the total sum of all the pixel values, this will be invariant to the shift. Okay? In the language of the, of the Fourier transform, this would be, this would correspond to looking at the zero frequency, the DC term, right? So why have you know the Fourier transform? And if we ever the Fourier transform and just look at the DC component of the whole signal, we know that by the law of black numbers it's going to converge to the DC term of, of, of the clean signal. And by the central limit theorem, we need that the number of signals to be greater than sigma squared. Right? Because the variance of this estimate would go like sigma squared over n. Right? So that's very nice that we can estimate one feature. Okay, we still need we still we need L of them, right? We need the entire signal. So we try to find other invariant features, and the next invariant feature is going to be the autocorrelation function. Okay, so you can take the, the signal, multiply by a shift of itself, and now average again over the group, over over all possible cyclic shifts. This will be invariant. Or equivalently, you can take its Fourier transform, the Fourier transform of the correlation function, and this is, this is called the power spectrum. <coughs> These are just the squared magnitudes of the Fourier coefficient. And you can see that they are invariant because when you shift the signal at each one of the Fourier coefficients, you just get phase modulated. Right? And so by taking the absolute value, you get rid of the, of the phase. So, you, so it's, it's shift invariant. And again, by the law of flight now, this will converge to the the power spectrum of the clean signal plus the power spectrum of the noise, which I assume to be white noise, so it's just sigma squared. So if you know sigma, you now get the power spectrum of the underlying clean signal. Okay, but now the number of signals that you need should scale a sigma to the four, okay, because you squared your measurement. So also now the squared gets amplified. Now we are missing the phase, okay, so we have the Fourier transform of, of our signal, but but we're still missing the phase of each one of the Fourier coefficients, except for the zero coefficient, which we know exactly. So how to find the phases? Well, we can construct another shift invariant feature by going to higher order features. So we look at the triple correlation function, or its Fourier transform, which is the which which, which took it called the bispectrum. So what is the bispectrum? The bispectrum is taking the triple product of three Fourier coefficients, and you pick frequencies that add up to zero. Okay, so for example, you take k1, k2, and minus k1, minus k2. So when you shift the signal, each one of the terms here gets phase modulated, but because you pick the three frequencies to add up to zero, those three, those three phase modulations, they just cancel out each other, no matter what is the shift. And so, and so this is invariant to the shift. And again, after you de-mean your, 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 your signal, this is, you can show this on the vice is also unbiased. And by the law of large numbers, you convert to the vice spectrum of the underlying clean signal. But now the number of signals should scale the signal to the six. Okay? Because it, you took the triple polar. Now the claim is that the vice spectrum contains the phase information and is generically invertible after the global shift of the, of the signal. If you, if you know the bias spectrum and your signal is generic, let's say its power spectrum does not vanish, then you can invert from the bias spectrum and get back the signal after the global shift. For example, if, 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 you have, if, if you know what is the, 
let's say if you guess what is the, because everything is up to a shift anyway, if you guess what is a, the phase of frequency one, okay, then you can get the phase of frequency two. Why? Because you can look at, at, at the bias spectrum corresponding to one, one, minus two. Okay, so you know one, you know one, then you know two. And then you can just do frequency matching and get all the phase. Then get three by knowing one and two, then get four and so on. It's not the most stable algorithm, but it just shows it can do inversion. So the message is that it, it is possible to accurately reconcile the signal from sufficiently many noisy shifted copies for arbitrary low SMR without estimating the shift. And even when we know ahead of time, the estimation of the shift is going to be poor. But notice that there is a strike difference between knowing the shift and unknowing the shift in terms of the, what is called the subtle complexity. How many, how many signals do you need in order to, to do a good job in the estimation? And it jumps from 1 over the SNR if you know the shift to 1 over SNR cube if you don't know the shift. Well, at least for this very simple algorithm that I just showed you based on, on, on a shifting bias, you can ask, okay, maybe there is an algorithm that can even do better. Well, we have some information theoretic results that said that no, you cannot do any better than that. Okay? Up to a constant. Okay? So the scaling with the SNR is, is at least as one over SNR cubed, and I just showed you an algorithm that achieved this, this scale. So how does it work in practice? So here you see in, in purple one of the noisy measurements. We take uh, 10 to the 4 of such. And what you see here is our reconstruction, okay? So, so in gold, you, you, you see the, the reconstruction by expectation of civilization, and in, in red, you see the reconstruction by the invariant features, okay? So it gives you more or less the same, the same uh, result, but there is a, a striking difference in terms of the running time, okay? So this is the running time of, of EM as a function of the number of measurements. And that's the running time of the invariant feature approach. Okay, so because the invariant feature of, and, and this is in log scale, okay, so there is another of models of magnitude difference. The reason is because you don't need to go through the data multiple times. Okay, basically what I just showed is like a, model, a method of moments approach, it's sort of maximum latitude, just to compute moments from the data, and to compute this, this, the, the moment statistics, you just need to go through the data only once. You know, to compute the, the average bar spectrum, to compute the average bar spectrum. So, so, this is it. And these are actually nice generalizations. For example, if the distribution is not uniform, okay, you don't know the distribution. So, the result I showed you before is for shifts that are uniform distributed over the unit circle. If they are not uniform, and you, don't, if you don't even need to know the distribution in advance. Then actually we can do better than sigma to the six, then we can solve it just sigma to the four. Okay, we have a very simple spectral algorithm to do that. And so in that case, moment mental class actually is even much faster than the end. So we just need to, to commit first and second order moments, we don't need to go to third order moments. But even more uh, remarkable is the fact that we can solve the heterogeneity problem by just looking at moments. So for example, if you have two signals, okay, two different signals, say one step and two step function, and these are noisy observation, clearly you cannot classify, just like you cannot estimate the shift, you cannot also classify or cluster the, the noisy observations. But if you compute the third order moment, okay, the first, second, third order moment, there is enough information. The third order moment is large enough, okay, there's enough degrees of freedom for which you can also do the to predict what were the original signals here. Okay. Obviously, you can also resolve, let's say, there were thousands of such uh, different uh, uh, classes, but we can relate the, the number of classes with the size of the signal. Okay, so very, very briefly how Kang's method works. So maybe instead of going with the mass, I'll just do a, a hand wavy argument of how it works. So re remember the size here. Okay, we call it the, the size here that we talked about before. And suppose that the orientation of the molecules are uniformly distributed, okay, over SO3. So what Kang said, he said, okay, in, in, in my language, okay, not in my, let, let's try to find invariants. So there are not much invariants because all the slices, they just go through the origin. 
So of course the DC term is again an invariant, but can we find other invariants? Well, if we just look at the slices, there is nothing much that we can hint for for invariants. Okay. So he says, okay, let's let's look at the following. Let's take our images, okay, and multiply in the Fourier domain, okay, two frequencies. Okay, let's say frequency k1 in image one is frequency k2 in image one. Okay, so it's a, take an image in, in the Fourier domain and you pick two frequencies, say k1 and k2, then you multiply their value. Okay, and now let's sum over all images and average. Then, what did this summation is doing for us is basically we know from the slicing that those two frequencies correspond to some 3D frequencies. We don't know which, which one, but we know that there is some rotation that will take them to frequencies in 3D. And, and this is true for any image. So, any image will, will give us some two frequencies that are all related by some rotation. So now when we sum over all of them, we basically did a Monte Carlo approximation to an integral over SO3. We don't, when you sum, you don't care about the other approximation. You don't, you don't really need to do, a, say, a Riemann sum and, and, and go by some specific order. Okay? You can sum by any order that you want, right? And so, this, this summation is basically approximates an integral over SO3. What is the integral? By the slice theorem, we know that the Fourier transform is I have correspond to the Fourier transform of the molecule. So basically, you take the molecule in Fourier domain times itself, it's an other frequency, and integrate. Well, it's just the autocorrelation function of the molecule with itself over SO3. So again, what this computes for is the autocorrelation function of the 3D Fourier transform of the molecule with itself over SO3. So just like the autocorrelation function over the circuit that we saw before gives give us the power spectrum if we take the Fourier transform, and the language is the is say the, the, the DFT, the discrete Fourier transform, the language to do Fourier transform over SO3 is spherical harmonics. And so you can get a lot of information about the spherical harmonic expansion of, of the structure. So you, you get a lot of information about those unknown coefficients of the spherical harmonics, functions of the radial frequency, by just computing this autocorrelation function. What I just told you to do here is just doing computing the combined, so basically doing PCA for the 2D images. The information in the PCA of the 2D images tells you a lot about the 3D structure itself. And <coughs> so, for the sake of time, let, let me just skip that. You can do homology, like similar tricks that they do in, in a, let's say, in crystallography. So, just like in crystallography, you have the phase problem and you can try to solve it using, the, using, let's say, molecular replacement. You can also solve the phase problem associated with current method because. It only tells, gives you the power spectrum, you're still missing phases. You can solve it by doing a similar either homology modeling or, or, or molecular replacement in, in cryo. But you can also try, okay, you need to compute the ECA, you have all sorts of tricks, <coughs> you pass it and skip that. You can also do really nice denoising using the covariance and also skip that. So, What we're trying to do now is to, to do it completely ab initio by going even to higher order, uh, just like we did for the bus spectrum in one D. You can also try to call like three frequencies, okay, multiplied by another frequency, and average over the over the group SO3, and from this to 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 get the structure. And we also try to extend it to non-uniform distribution. So there is a very stringent assumption in Kamm's theory that the distribution of rotation is uniform. And so what we are trying to do now is just like in the non-uniform multi-reference salamis, to solve for both the signal of the molecule and the distribution of rotation. 
and also to extend to non sensitive images. And we will get to a So you can ask me, okay, why should you bother? Because there is already the maximum likelihood of course that, 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 that so far prevailed. But there are some very uh, strong advantages of, 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 of doing this uh, generalized comment method. One is that it is extremely fast. Okay, you can just compute the moments by one pass of the data. And it can even lead to the possibility of, of doing RIM by streaming, okay? You don't even need to store the data, okay? And, and, and storage is a big issue because the data that generate, especially with the video camera, will give you the high resolution, it can, can, can get to terabytes of data. And you can also just use it as a validation tool, okay? You don't need any static model, that's like they did in, in, in maximum likelihood. And, and you don't need to worry about rotation being estimated correctly. So, why was Kant's method uh, mostly forgotten? Well, from my perspective, it was an example of an idea that was really ahead of its time, okay? So when Kant proposed it in, in the late 70s, early 80s, they worked with, with like data sets that have like dozens of particles, okay? So you can't really compute second order statistics, not to mention set order statistics. And also, when we try to, to estimate second order statistics, we we, we apply all sorts of tricks, okay, or okay. so let's say from, from uh, high dimensional statistics, uh, how to do eigenvalue like shrinkage and, and idea like that, that's what you do suddenly, let's say, in the last 15 years. Okay, so if you want to do a, an accurate job, I mean, this was for all theory statistics that was unavailable at the time. Uh, but most importantly, it requires any from distribution of mean direction that we are not trying to relate this assumption. And by now, the maximum likelihood. Uh, framework uh, prevent. Uh, in recent years, there was revived interest in Kant theory uh, in, in, a, in another field of uh, uh, say, structural determination of, of, of molecules using X ray field to lasers. Okay? So they attempt to do using, the, using femtosecond uh, imaging, diffraction imaging, to, to get the uh, to get the structure of, of, of molecules, and more or less the same form emerges that you don't know the beginning direction. Okay. So uh, similar ideas, uh, there is a, a lot of providing of so that comes here that, that comes from, from the expert field on laser area. So to conclude, uh, Kant has paved the way to the construction of one or more structures so a single pass of the data, no rotation estimation, no clustering, if you're in the genetic case. A reconstruction is possible at any SLR, okay? So there is no limit to query, we just need more data but to scale uh, either as one over SLR cube or maybe in other situation uh, as one over SLR squared. But this, definitely there is a striking difference from, from the one over SLR in classical statistics. So, some of the methods that I mentioned today are also available in our open source uh, software toolbox called Aspire, the single path for reconstruction. And this is a joint work uh, with both my students and the postdocs, former students and postdocs. But may I want to mention Fred Seabrook, who is uh, uh, doing CRAWLM at Yale Medical School, and then uh, Josh Kolnitsky, who is uh, uh, my long-time collaborator is now at the Tel Aviv University. And here are some references for those who want to learn more about this. Thank you very much.